In this video, I want to take a look at the Stamp Act, which is one of the first taxation acts passed by the British in the post-war years of the Seven Years' War. I want to explore the way the colonists react to this particular law. Now, the Stamp Act is passed by Parliament in March of 1765 with the intention of it going into effect in November of 1765. This act is different than prior acts, which, um, you know, when you see the British tax the colonists in prior acts, this is done to regulate trade. The Stamp Act is different. It's not regulating trade at all. Instead, Parliament is trying to raise money. And this is how the Stamp Act works. Colonists are supposed to purchase stamps from stamp agents who are kind of like customs officials. And these stamps act as, as a proof of payment for this particular tax. The stamps are supposed to be attached to anything paper-based like playing cards, newspapers, legal documents, like marriage certificates, things of that nature. You might also see stamps applied to goods such as dice or things that they're getting ready to export elsewhere. It's important to know that the British on the opposite side of the Atlantic had been paying for stamps for almost 100 years. So to Parliament, this act is not a big deal in their minds because it's, it's a part of everyday life in Great Britain. Now there are about five different colonial reactions to the Stamp Act and each foreshadow colonial reactions that will occur throughout the rest of the 1760s and into the 1770s as Parliament tried to pass more taxes. The first colonial reaction I want to talk about are disputes over representation. The colonists see the Stamp Act as a threat to their liberty. They've never had to pay a direct tax before, and they're worried that this sets a precedent. They're worried that Parliament can essentially bankrupt them any time that they want to. The colonists argue that because they do not get to vote for members of Parliament directly, they aren't represented within Parliament. Therefore, they shouldn't have to pay the tax. And oftentimes, you've heard this phrase before, this argument is referred to as no taxation without representation. The British have a response for this argument. They say that all British citizens are virtually represented by all members of Parliament. The reason for this virtual representation argument exists in the way people are able to vote in Great Britain. Many British are not able to vote because of the property ownership requirements and an overall lack of land in Great Britain. We see entire regions, including cities such as Manchester or Leeds, don't even get to elect their own representatives to parliament. So the colonists are not the only one that have this experience of not directly representing or not directly electing anyone into parliament. As a consequence, the Crown says the colonists are no different than the residents of Manchester. The residents of Manchester pay their stamp tax and so should the colonists. The first official reaction to the Stamp Act occurs in May of 1765 in Virginia. At the close of the Virginia House of Burgesses, a representative moves to discuss the Stamp Act. Patrick Henry quickly seconds the motion and they start to have a conversation. A number of members are shocked by this situation in the Virginia House of Burgesses. They believe that Virginia has no right to reconsider laws already passed by Parliament. The Virginia House of Burgesses, in their minds, is not higher than Parliament. And by virtue of discussing a law that already exists, they believe that they're making that statement, that they are higher than or better than Parliament. Patrick Henry poses seven resolutions. These become known as the Virginia Resolutions. Only five of those pass, and one is by a very narrow margin. The very last resolution that passes only passes by one vote. However, all seven resolutions are published in colonial newspapers across the region, and they're all seen as kind of radical. So here's what the Virginia Resolutions say, all seven of them. They start by saying that colonists hold the same rights as British citizens ab abroad across the Atlantic. And there are two royal charters that guarantee those rights. The colonists have a right to self-taxation, 
which is a distinguishing characteristic of British freedom. The Virginia House of Burgesses has always exclusively had the sole power of self-government and self-taxation. And in prior times, the monarchy and the British have always recognized and respected this. They reaffirm that the Virginia House of Burgesses has the sole right to tax Virginians and that any attempts to force them to surrender this right would be tantamount to a destruction of British or American freedom. The colonists do not have to follow any law unless passed by the Virginia House of Burgesses. And lastly, anyone who disagrees with any of these resolutions is an enemy of the colonies. Our next example of colonial pushback on the Stamp Acts occurs in August of 1765 in Massachusetts. We see a series of riots that occur, and these are led by John Hancock and Samuel Adams. These guys will eventually lead the Sons of Liberty. They are inspired by what Patrick Henry has said and done with the Virginia Resolutions. So they band together with a group of other people in Massachusetts and start to resist. These examples of resistance include protests in the streets, tarring and feathering people, and the destruction of property. In particular, Andrew Oliver's home, who was supposed to be a stamp agent to collect money for the sale of these stamps, as well as the lieutenant governor's home, Thomas Hutchinson. They do some pretty major damages to both structures. And these events are reported back to Great Britain. Not long after the chaos in Massachusetts in August, the Massachusetts House of Representatives invites several different colonies to send delegates to New York for a Stamp Act Congress in October. Nine colonies send delegates, and overall there are 27 delegates in attendance. Inside this assembly, the colonists draft a statement of rights, a statement of grievances, and demand the repeal of the Stamp Act. Does this sound a little familiar? We do this again in 1776 when we declare our independence, when we, um, Thomas Jefferson will declare human rights, and he will list a number of grievances against the crown. Now, much like many of the other petitions that will be sent to England, both Parliament and the monarch generally ignore the resolutions from the Stamp Act Congress. But this gathering of colonists is important for two reasons. First, it brings the colonies together. It bands them together together. And second, it will set a precedent for future resistance in terms of gathering together and in terms of protesting. The last set of colonial resistance will come from seaport merchants in places like New York, Pennsylvania, and Boston. Seaport merchants will demand a repeal of the Stamp Act as well, and the way they will do this is through a series of boycotts. They not only boycott the purchase of British goods, they also refuse to pay back any of their debts to Britain. Ultimately, all of this resistance will lead the Crown to reconsider. They will repeal the Stamp Act in March of 1766. Throughout the entire colonies, even though it went into effect in November of 1765, not a single stamp will be sold. Most of the Stamp Act agents will resign from the post the minute that violence becomes a possibility. And so the Stamp Act, is, is, it, it's dead in the water. Um, it, it's not successful. Parliament sees the potential for civil crisis, so they back off. However, they pass the Declaratory Act, which makes it clear that Parliament has the right to make laws governing the colonies. And this will set the stage for future taxation legislation. 